Live from Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York, I'm Shanali Basic. And I'm Katie Greifeld, in for Kelly Lines. Welcome to Bloomberg Crypto, a look at the people, transactions, and technology shaping the world of decentralized finance. Coming up, investors are wondering what the next big thing will be for the world of cryptocurrencies after the debut of those spot Bitcoin ETFs. And we'll discuss what it all means for crypto exchanges with Kraken CEO Dave Ripley. And details from Do Kwan's lawyer about his potential extradition in a $40 billion fraud case. That's all ahead. But first, let's look at a snapshot of these markets right now. You can see Bitcoin above $43,000 a coin, up about eight tenths of a percent. We know that last week turned into a bit of a sell the news moment, but coming back a bit now, so too is Ether. You take a look at Ether, currently up about 1.7 percent, outpacing Bitcoin's rise. So too is Coinbase. A lot of questions about what the debut of spot Bitcoin ETFs will mean for Coinbase, whether that will take away trading volume. Coinbase was down 15 percent last week alone, currently up about 2.3 percent. Those questions also apply to MicroStrategy. MicroStrategy not quite able to go into the green today, down about two-tenths of a percent, Shanali. I want to talk now more about those Bitcoin ETFs and the movements they have had in the market and the impact it's had on Bitcoin prices. Katie, if you take a look here, you saw movement out of the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust converting to an ETF by the tune of almost $600 million in those first days of trading. And where did the money go? On one hand, there was some selling, but you also saw hundreds of millions of dollars, nearly $800 million, go into Bitcoin ETFs. And it was partly a matter of fees, but also a matter of brand name. You did see BlackRock, Fidelity, really raking in the bulk of the assets here. Bitwise ARC also having a strong showing, but a lot of questions in terms of what the flows look like moving forward and the impact it will have on the crypto community. Leaders so far are sharing some optimism about the path forward. Take a listen to Circle CEO Jeremy Allaire speaking at Davos earlier today. This is a watershed moment. You have uh, signaling from, you know, all the major participants in the financial sector, the exchanges, the biggest trading houses, you know, the biggest asset managers, that they're moving into this space. And that's a kind of validation. And I think to the average, uh, whether it be person or institution or large internet firm, this sends a signal that this is now connecting to the global financial system. And joining us now is David Ripley. He is the CEO of Kraken. David, there's a lot of questions here about the future of the exchanges now that we have spot ETFs on the market, the business model, the fees in transacting on exchanges for Bitcoin. Is there a negative impact in the future given we see so much trading in ETFs? Uh, well, thanks for having me on. It's great to be here. Uh, you know, as far as impact on Kraken's business, this is uh, undoubtedly a net positive for us. Um, and there's, you know, a few different areas where that comes out. So first off, our mission is to grow cryptocurrency adoption that can achieve this end goal of financial freedom. And hey, this, you know, the, the introduction of ETFs is another access point for individuals to, to come into the space. So frankly, this is in line with our mission in, in a positive. As, as it relates to our business specifically, so... I mean, the first thing I'll mention is that, you know, we benefit directly from this. Um, Kraken provides the indice for six of the 11 uh, spot Bitcoin at e ETFs that were approved. So we, you know, directly benefit from this as uh, these ETFs are our, our customers. Um, and that's via one of our a Kraken business uh, by the name of CF Benchmarks. Mm -hmm. um, the second is we're just going to, you know, it's yet another access point it's uh, an easier path for some uh, to get into cryptocurrency, to you know, get their first exposure to Bitcoin. That's going to grow the overall ecosystem. Uh, exposure and uh, awareness is going to grow. And these things grow the overall, uh, overall industry in total. OK, sure, it's possible that some newer individuals to crypto may first uh, go and buy an ETF as opposed to <clears throat> go into Kraken or Coinbase, some of our peers. But that's entirely fine. You mm -hmm. know, Kraken offers a plethora of different features and functionality, 200 plus tokens and a number of different uh, services that you can't just get from an ETF, um, namely the ability to, you know, actually hold Bitcoin and, right. and custody it yourself. So I think this is a, a really a fantastic event in a, in a net positive for, for Kraken in so many ways. 
Well, just to dwell on this point a little longer, you think about the bear cases for crypto exchanges coming out of these spot Bitcoin mm -hmm. ETFs finally launches. And the point has been made uh, plenty of times that you think about these ETFs, some of them costing 20 basis points or be below for an annual cost. And you compare that to the cost of trading on a Coinbase, on a Kraken, and uh, there's a difference there. Do you plan to lower the cost of trading to compete with these? <clears throat> yeah. Um you know, again, it's a great question. I, I think there's a couple of things. One, we we view the the offerings, the products different enough such that they're they're really not direct substitutes, if you will. And so, um, yes, there's a different price point for that product, but it's a different product. And so, um, we don't you know have any plans to adjust adjust fees or 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 anything of the like. You know, due to this introduction, like I said, I think we offer plethora of different you know products in services that you know differ in a lot of ways from the from the ETF. How do custody fees start to compare with trading fees? <clears throat> if if you do see a compression, at least even initially, in trading volumes and people moving to ETFs, how do you build a business off of custody <clears throat> that is as robust? Will it be as robust as it was on the spot trading? Yeah. <clears throat> well for Kraken specifically, we're actually uh, in uh, set to launch our custody product this quarter. So this is, you know, will be a big event for us, um, you know, and something that, uh, you know, kind of brings it in a new and interesting uh, custody product to the market. And so I do think that for a lot of customers, and again, you know, the ETFs themselves being customers of exchange venues and custody providers like Kraken, um, there is often a synergy between the two. Right. And so and there's clearly a convenience to be able to custody at the same place where you find liquidity. Um, of course, in some instances, uh, you know, businesses choose to use uh, an alternate custody provider in addition uh, and or even custody themselves. And so I think there are those alternatives out there, but there's definitely a synergy between the two. And so I think usually when when clients, customers of ours are looking at the, the offering, they, they kind of view it as a full package. When it comes to the custodian business, how do you differentiate yourself? Because on the crypto native side, if you want to call it that, you have Coinbase, you have Gemini, and then you have on the TradFi uh, side of the ledger, of course, you have Fidelity, et cetera. When it comes to custodian and attracting actual new business there, how do you plan to do it? <clears throat> yeah, well, I think there's a, you know, probably two things. You know, Kraken has a long, uh, long history in the, in the industry you know, over a decade. And uh, we built this company with security in mind and security first. One of our co-founders likes to refer to Kraken as a security company with an exchange built on top. Um, and so uh, this is something that is known extensively throughout the industry, that Kraken is one of the uh, strongest when it comes to security. We have the features and functionality on that front to prove it. Um, and so that's one of the, the top things that that, uh, that customers look for when they look for custody. So I think that's number number one for us and uh, where we look for from a, uh, you know, a custody standpoint and, and what we'll, we'll look to, to differentiate with. The other how, piece how do you, right, David, I mean, you, there's custody and then there's other businesses that you could potentially get into. How do you see yourself using a banking license and, and diversifying into financial services? Yeah, so um, I think you're referring to the um, <clears throat> special purpose depository institution license that we have um, with uh, with the state of Wyoming, and it, it is a it is a a different and novel license that's out there that actually they've embedded into their law some very crypto specific um, uh, parts of the law that govern this custody. Effectively, you know what happens during forks and various different events that are are, are net positive for for customers, and so we think that's going to be um, yet another benefit that that we can bring to to you know potential custody customers. All right, David, got to leave it there. Hope to check in with you again soon. Bye. Really appreciate your time. That is Kraken CEO. David Ripley. Now we do want to turn to some breaking news right now. Uh, coming in the last couple of minutes, Spirit Airlines really plunging right now, currently halted for volatility. That's after a judge blocked its merger with JetBlue on antitrust grounds. JetBlue falling a little bit. Uh, Spirit Airlines, though, down about 61 percent before it being halted for volatility. Let's get some more context now with George Ferguson of Bloomberg Intelligence joining us now for more. George, how surprising is this? 
Well, so I think it, uh, you know, near the end of the trial, it seemed like it was really close to 50-50 whether or not the judge was going to deny this, uh, this purchase or not. So I don't know that it's super surprising, but Spirit, obviously, if you were invested in Spirit shares, uh, I think you were really hanging on, uh, you know, the acquisition by JetBlue. So uh, I think what you see is a lot of people exiting based on that. Well, how do you think about the future of Spirit Airlines without this deal? Uh, I think it's difficult, right? So uh, Spirit, not even profitable in 3Q, traditionally a very strong quarter for U.S. airlines. Um, you know, if you look at co consensus in the Bloomberg uh, terminal, you'd see that uh, they don't, uh, the consensus estimates don't show profitability for a number of years. Uh, we typically don't look out quite that far, but consensus doesn't show profitability for a number of years. Uh, I mean, the U.S. airline business really looks over capacitized right now, if that's a, if that's a word. Uh, you know, we saw Delta's earnings uh, on uh, Friday. Uh, domestic fares were declining. Uh, you know, essentially Delta showed um, a pretty, uh, uh, you know, th like a 12% growth in revenue, but very flat operating profit because uh, fares are weakening, in, especially in domestic markets, and expenses are going up because pilots are getting paid more. And I would expect that to be even worse at the airlines that are more focused on the domestic market, Spirit being one of them, and they're in one of the weaker shapes here as we, uh, as we go through this decline in, uh, in fares. All right, George, really appreciate your quick insight. That is Bloomberg Intelligence's George Ferguson. Now coming up, we'll catch up with Raleigh Perduhova, CEO of 7RCC Global, next. This is Bloomberg. This really brings Bitcoin into a much broader investable asset class for trillions of dollars of assets. Previously, RIAs, many wealth managers, pensions couldn't access spot crypto, and this gives them a vehicle, it gives them a very familiar wrapper that they can now access through the traditional securities markets. So we think this is a wonderful step forward, bringing crypto to mainstream. And that was Coinbase CFO Alicia Haas speaking to Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix at Davos about none other than those spot Bitcoin ETFs making their debut last week. And let's keep the conversation going now with Raleigh Perduhova, co-founder and CEO of 7RCC Global, which filed for a spot Bitcoin and carbon credits futures ETF in December, a little Bitcoin ESG to get the blood pumping. Let's talk about the competitive landscape here because out the door, we already have 10, 11 spot Bitcoin ETF issuers. And I know you can't talk too specifically about an active filing, but how do you plan to differentiate yourself? Thank you, Katie. Uh, well, I think this is just the beginning of uh, a lot of filings that will come up with a very different angle, with thematic, um, you know, preposition. And, uh, you know, we're glad to be one of the first ones out there showing something different. When you say thematic proposition, is this the ESG angle over, over the Bitcoin overlay? And what, what does that really mean, given Bitcoin has not been known to be the most eco-friendly? Well, obviously, I can't really speak a lot about the strategy. But um, you know, in our view, those two asset classes are very similar in some sense. You know, they're both new asset classes. Uh, and they offer, you know, exposure to clients for a lot of upside down the road. Okay, so uh, a lot of blue sky there. Let's talk about how big this arena could actually get. Because again, we talk about the fact that what there's about a dozen spot Bitcoin ETFs out there. There's plenty more S and P 500 ETFs out there. How big do you think that the spot Bitcoin industry in the U.S. could actually become? Well, I think the estimates are about 40 billion in inflows uh, over the next one year. And if we use uh, Canada as a, as a playbook, uh, you know, we saw about a billion in AUM within the first month of inflows. And Canada is about 40 times smaller uh, market than US. So I think 40 billion, it's about a realistic estimate that we're going to see here. And that obviously will put some price pressure and hopefully you know, uh, decrease the volatility. 
maybe <laughs> decrease the volatility as uh, Bitcoin goes mainstream. I want to talk a little bit more about Bitcoin price. Since you think about what happened last week, uh, I think a lot of people within the cryptocurrency community were surprised to see Bitcoin fall in the days after uh, the ETFs were launched. How are you thinking about the dynamic between these products now being available and what we're seeing in the actual price? Well, I think it will take time before um, you know we see more of a mainstream adoption and before we see it on the distribution channels of, of the usual Wall Street um, players. But uh, I think over time, I'm in a camp of a 100,000 uh, Bitcoin price. And uh, I mean, that, that affects uh, the whole you know, digital asset space, right? We saw Ethereum going um, up and already pricing some possible Ethereum spot uh, you would, you would still have to double, though, to get to 100,000. And yeah. in the advent of the spot ETF, you still saw a decline, uh, given the run-up we've recently seen. So what takes you from 43,000 to 100? Well, I think it's simple supply demand, right? If you have 40 billion of inflows and a limited supply of Bitcoins, it will put pressure on pricing. Um, so I, I'm pretty optimistic on, on, on that price target. What about Ethereum? On one hand, you did see some pressure on Bitcoin in the days right after the ETF, but you did see some optimism in Ethereum. How soon do you think it will take the market to move on quickly to that next ETF for a different crypto asset? Well, I think the, the Bitcoin uh, ETFs have been a great stepping stone and will open the door for probably a little bit of a quicker, um, you know, uh, new uh, coins, wrapper ETFs out there, and Ethereum will be probably the first one. But if we use, um, you know, Europe as an example, we see some, you know, coins wrapped in into ETFs like Cardano and Polkadot and Solana. So it will be interesting to see what else comes out there. Well, when we think about what could be next, uh, now that we're past the launch of these spot Bitcoin products, what do you think the future holds for the Bitcoin futures products? That's a great question. Um, well, I think there still could be used for a lot of hedging strategies, and there is a space for them as well. We see that in other commodities out there where there is future and spot. So um, I think that won't be any different. What about the future of exchanges? We just had a conversation with Kraken as well. Do you think that the spot trading will hold up to be just as robust when investors now have more options? Well, it's interesting to see what happens in the, in the industry right now. Uh, we probably will see some consolidations in exchanges, custody. Um, you know, uh, there, is, there is a lot out there and a lot of big, you know, Wall Street banks now looking at the space. So I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing some consolidation in the space. Raleigh Perdurov of 7RCC Global, we thank you so much for your time. Flurry of filers up for the market. Coming up next, CoinShares is buying an ETF business from Valkyrie. We'll talk more about that next. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. There's a company that I like called Tether. It's a, it's a stable coin. And, you know, I manage uh, many, many of their assets. And the Tether Holdings is the name of the group. And the group, I want to say it here with you, from what we've seen, and we did a lot of work, they have the money they say they have. In the last attestation, they said they had 86 billion of assets and 83 billion of liabilities. And I've seen a whole lot, and the firm has seen a whole lot, and they have the money. And so there's always been a lot of talk. Do they have it or not? So I'm with you guys saying uh, we've seen it and they have it. And that was Cantor Fitzgerald, CEO Howard Lutnick, speaking to Bloomberg earlier today in Davos about Tether's reserves, just one of the many conversation and stories that we're following in the crypto world. Yeah, and a few more stories that caught our attention this week. Cash Key Group, one of Hong Kong's two licensed crypto exchanges, said it raised nearly $100 million in a funding round, giving it a so-called unicorn status. The company operates a trading platform as well as crypto venture funding and asset management in Hong Kong and Singapore. Hash Key's valuation 
is now around $1.2 billion. Up next, we have Terraform Labs co-founder Do Kwan. He could be extradited to the U.S. by mid-March to face charges. Kwan is accused of orchestrating a $40 billion cryptocurrency fraud scheme. Currently, he's in custody in Montenegro for traveling on a fake passport. And lastly, CoinShares. It exercised an option to buy an ETF business from rival Valkyrie Investments. The decision came two days after Valkyrie's Bitcoin ETF started trading under the ticker BRRR. CoinShares expects the deal to bolster assets under management currently at $4.5 billion by $110 million. Now, that's an interesting number given that some of the largest asset managers in the world were now playing in the Bitcoin uh, wave here. But consolidation nonetheless, what does it give them, Katie? Yeah, it's interesting. Obviously, they're getting a uh, Valkyrie suite of ETFs, not worth too much, but $100 million, you know, uh, still something to write home about. And I think this story really stuck out to me because we talk about consolidation both in the ETF world and in the crypto industry uh, quite often. And when it comes to the uh, crypto ETF world, I mean, I'm sure you asked this question and were asked this question many times last week. Does the world need a dozen U.S. listed <laughs> spot Bitcoin ETFs? And already you're starting to see some combinations well, here. Well, interestingly enough, Valkyrie had among the highest fees by having uh, the house of coin shares over it. Do you think that they are incentivized to compete harder on fees or is it late anyways? It's a great question. I mean, how do you stand out? It seems like the answer for most issuers up to this point has been let's compete on fees. But then you push back a little bit. I mean, what else can you do except cut your fees to basically zero? And it comes down, I keep hearing it, trust and experience in the crypto industry. Obviously, uh, Valkyrie and a lot of these other issuers have that. It'll uh, remains to be seen whether that matters to the financial advisors, et cetera, that they're trying to market to, whether they care about crypto experience or traditional finance experience, whether they would just trust a BlackRock and Fidelity. Speaking of BlackRock and Fidelity, we've been talking about the inflows they brought in, but BlackRock, Larry mm -hmm. Fink, the CEO, took a moment there to really talk through the idea not that everything can be ETF, not just that, but that tokenization yeah. will also take over many, many asset classes. You know, Adina Friedman once told me that every asset in the world can be digitized. So let's see how that goes. The next I have to years. say, after I heard Larry Fink say tokenization, I had to like take a moment and Google <laughs> it because he's he's ahead of me. I've been so focused on uh, this spot Bitcoin ETF that I've, I forgot about tokenization and all the promise. Apollo's that the is doing it. JP Morgan's doing it. Wall Street is coming for the tokens. All the cool kids <laughs> are doing it. Uh, that does it for us, though. A programming note for next week. Bloomberg Crypto will be every Tuesday at noon Eastern starting next week. This is Bloomberg Crypto and this is Bloomberg.